Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Bell's theorem uh, and quantum mechanics' is most famous problem. So, uh, yeah, before we start, we have to talk about, um, you know, the, the stuff that came before what I'm going to be talking about. Basically, there were two conflicting theories um, in, in the beginning of the 20th century about uh, sort of like interpretations of quantum mechanics. Basically, Bohr and Einstein had two different ideas about reality um, and what they thought was happening at the quantum scale when we're talking about particles. <coughs> Bohr thought uh, he was a proponent of what's called the Copenhagen interpretation, which basically says that you, you, the properties of a particle quite literally don't exist until you measure them. Um, and Einstein thought this was ridiculous, and he thought, of course, the particle must know before it does something what it was, what it's going to do. It's going to have properties before they're measured. Essentially, what what these were called were hidden variables. So just like normal, real everyday life, if I chuck a glass at a wall, it knows before it hits the wall that it's going to smash. Um, and that's reflected in his very famous quote that God does not play dice with the world. Um, and so, basically, in 1935, Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen uh, released a paper about this. Um, and it detailed one of the most famous problems in all of quantum mechanics um, that a lot of people, even who aren't familiar with most of quantum mechanics, know about, which is entanglement. Um, and basically, what they described was a mechanism whereby you produce a pair of entangled particles. So if we consider, for example, the conservation of angular momentum or spin. If you have one particle that has spin zero and it emits a particle that has spin up, for example, then it also necessarily has to emit, emit a particle that has spin down in the other direction. Um, and so they said, let's take a particle and it emits one photon with spin up in one direction and one photon with spin down in the other direction necessarily. And then you measure one of those and you find that it's spin up and therefore, necessarily, the other one has to be spin down, because otherwise spin has not been conserved. Uh, and what this means, basically, they argued, was that by measuring one particle, if, if, the, uh, if, if Bohr's interpretation that the particle decided upon measurement which value it had, then it would mean that information needs to be transmitted instantaneously so faster than the speed of light from one particle to the other, which doesn't work. Therefore, it's a paradox. And they use this as an argument for the fact that hidden variables, or these predetermined properties, are the case. Um, and it actually took almost 30 years before we found a solution to this. Um, and in that time frame, both interpretations were actually seen as valid. And this was a paradox that still needed solving. But then, in 1964, a guy called John Bell, who actually had a day job as a CERN engineer, so this wasn't his uh, main occupation, uh, he came up with a theorem, a solution for this. He formulated an experiment whereby you can actually prove that if, it, if particles that are entangled have a certain correlation, um, then it means either hidden variables are the case, or that they're deciding upon interaction that they didn't know before. So, uh, yeah, like I said there, according to Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, the particles knew beforehand what they were going to do. According to Bohr, they don't know. You can't know before they're going to do it. Um, so, yeah, before we get to Bell's test, uh, we're going to talk about a bit about polarizing filters and some other stuff. Um, Bell's test can basically be thought of in terms of light passing through polarizing filters. Uh, it's probably easier if I write this on the board. Do you have a pen? Yeah, yeah. So we know that if we pass light through a vertical filter that is like this, it's only going to be oscillating vertically, right? And so if we then pass it through a horizontal filter, no component of this oscillation is in the horizontal direction so no light is going to come out. If we have uh, a, this, this vertical wave, polarized by this filter, and you pass it through a filter of 45 degrees, well then, some component of this, you can think of this 
as being sort of like, um, like this. So it has this component in that direction. And so some of it, but just less, will come out the other side. Um, and basically, the interesting thing is, is that when, when you have this vertical and horizontal, no light comes out the other side. But what if you then put a 45 degree filter in the middle, like in there, the expectation would be probably that still no light comes through, because you've still got these two filters and no light comes through. And what actually happens is you get more light coming through when the filters are added. And what's happening here is the light is being polarized in this direction. So here, it has no component in the horizontal direction. You pass it through a 45 degree first, it then becomes in this direction, and then it does actually have a component in the horizontal direction, and you can polarize it horizontally as well. So, um, and the way that this relates to Bell's theorem is that the proportion of light that comes through when you add a filter is, is different for quantum mechanical interpretation or hidden variables interpretation. So let's say we have two filters. One is the vertical one and one is at 45 degrees. Um, if you have one at 45 degrees, then 50% of the light is going to come through uh, the filter. But when you add the filter at 22.5 degrees, which is halfway between, what you probably would expect is that, okay, so it's halfway through, halfway between them, so you'll get 75% passing through that one, and then another 75% passing through that one, which gives you the overall 50%, as you would expect. But this isn't what happens. What actually happens is 85% passes through when it's at an angle of 22.5%, and then another 85% uh, passes through when it passes through the second angle. Um, so actually what you get instead of 50% of light being blocked when you add in this third filter, you get 70% of light coming through rather than 50%. And using the mathematics of probability, we can actually show that if the particles knew beforehand what they were going to do, which filter they were going to go through, um, then this, is, this just isn't possible because of the proportions. Um, and also, basically the way it's working is that the, the relationship of the angle between the filters and how much light is coming through or is blocked is related by a trigonometric function instead of a linear function as you would expect with um, hidden variables. So this is one sort of analog to Bell's, uh, to, yeah, Bell's theorem basically. Um, there's another way of thinking about it as well, which is if you imagine a game between you and the universe, and the universe is putting down pairs of checker pieces, which are red and black. And you say, you get to decide whether two reds or two blacks mean a win, or a red and a black separately mean a win. And so let's say you pick, okay, two of the same color is a win, and the universe picks the pieces, puts them down, and they're all different colors. So then the next game you say, okay, let's say the different cut pieces are a win. The universe picks the pieces again. Now all the pairs are the same color. Again, so then red, red, black, black, red, red, whatever. Um, but so Einstein thinking in this, Einstein's thinking in this case would probably be that the game is rigged and that the universe is actually just picking pieces um, so that you can't win, because it knows from the beginning. Um, and Bohr's thinking would be that the pieces don't even have any color until they're revealed. Uh, you can't know the color. They literally don't have a color until they're revealed. Um, and now, so you can test this by saying, okay, what if you only pick which combination, whether two of the same pieces or two different pieces, wins after the universe is chosen? So you let the universe pick the pieces, and then you say, okay, together, two, two of the same color wins. And if you keep losing them, then it proves, then, then you would assume that the pieces are not predetermined, so the universe can decide still, right? Um, and if you now win 50% of the time, then the colors were predetermined because the universe already picked them before you said which combination was going to win. So now we get to Bell's proposed test. Basically, he pro proposed a test that's similar to the polarizing filter test, um, but it's slightly different because 
there's an argument that can be made when you have one photon passing through lots of different filters. There's sort of like loopholes, and uh, still an argument that you can, you can make for hidden variables. So he wanted to try and eliminate as many of these loopholes, as they're called, um, as, as possible, so that you can really actually prove that there are no hidden variables at work or wherever they are. So what's, what, what's happening is you entangle two electrons with opposite spins, and you basically measure the spins at different angles. So it's like with the filters at different angles. Um, and again, you get this higher correlation between the measured spins of the electrons than hidden variables would allow for. Um, and I'll explain that in the next slide a bit more in detail. But actually, the first Bell test without any loopholes whatsoever was done in 2015, actually at TU Delft. Um, and so now we know that hidden variables, at least at Einstein, as Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen proposed them, are impossible. So basically, it's a really difficult concept to grasp how it works. The two electrons have opposite spins when they're produced because of the way that they're produced. Um, and if you measure the spin of one in the vertical direction, you necessarily then know that the spin of the other is the opposite in that same direction because of this conservation of spin, like what we talked about with the EPR uh, paradox. But if you measure the spin of the other electron in a different direction, because of quantum mechanics, it forces it to have a, a whole spin in that direction. It can't because it, quanta mean it's quantized, right? So you can't have you can't have like a bit of it. It's got to be all or nothing um, in that one direction. So the correlation. Um, yeah, so you, you force it to have a spin in a different direction to the other electron. Um, but the correlation between the spin that it would have in the vertical direction, if you measured it, and the spin that is, uh, is observed when you measure it at an angle, is, is, is basically where the difference arises. Because some component of that vertical spin, like with the filters, is in that direction. And so you're going to get a leaning towards either up or down spin depending on the angle, and the proportion of that is going to be uh, different depending on the angle. Yeah. And basically, uh, you can think of the spin as being like the polarization of the light, um, and the angle at which it is measured to be like the angle of the filters, uh, and basically the correlation between the vertical spin and the measured spins on average that you get after lots of tests is kind of like the correlation between the angle and how much light passes through. Um, so for example, if I was to say you have uh, you measure one electron to have spin down, which means the other electron has spin up necessarily, right? But you measure the spin of this electron not with a, 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 a device that is in this direction, but it's at an angle. You use what's called a stern gerlach um, device. Um, so if you put this at an angle, of say 22.5 degrees, some component of this spin is again in that direction. So if I measure it in this direction, then you can rewrite, like, show this arrow as that and that together, which gives you that. Um, and basically, how much of these are measured to be spin up in this direction or spin down in this direction shows the correlation. Again, it's, it, it's a really difficult, weird concept to grasp because we're dealing with electrons here. But basically, the implications and conclusion of this is that Bell's theorem shows that Einstein and his colleagues were wrong because of this the Bell test that was done in 2015. Um, and quantum mechanics does not allow for these hidden variables. So particles really, truly do not have any properties until they actually interact with things. So then another question that arises is this instant communication. The whole paradox that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen were talking about is that hidden various variables must exist because otherwise information is being transmitted at the speed of light, no, faster than the speed of light, from one particle to the other, which is impossible. Um, my interpretation personally, um, and that of a lot of others, is that it, because entangled particles have only one wave function, by measuring one of them, 
you're actually collapsing that single wave function. Um, and so you're not, you're basically like measuring one particle, and so it's fine. Although another explanation is, is that there's actually no information being transmitted in the physics sense of the term information um, faster than light, because the information is basically useless until you have access to it, and you only have access to it after the information has traveled at the speed of light or slower. Thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Is, um, is quantum, a quantum entanglement used like to build kind of um, uh, teleportation machines? Uh, I, I can't say, like, of course we don't have teleportation machines. I think. I As think like people particle like teleportations. Like, uh, like only for particles. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Yes. How can you entangle two particles? Like. So basically, uh, it works similar to the, con the principle of conservation of momentum or whatever. Um, particles sometimes have a property called spin, where basically it can either you can either have a particle that's spinning up, for example, or it's spinning down, for example. Yeah. And if you and this, the principle is that. There's, an, uh, there's another principle of conservation, which is conservation of angular momentum, basically conservation of spin. So if you have a particle that has no spin, and it releases one particle in this direction that has spin up, then it has to release another particle that has spin down, because otherwise spin would not be conserved. And so if you then measure this particle, and find that it has a spin down, then necessarily this particle must have a spin up because otherwise spin is not being conserved. Thank you. Yeah, more? Is there um, a limit to how far particles can be that they can stay entangled together? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. In this case, no, basically. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, again, the spin has to be conserved. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, girl. Thank you. <laughs>